Welcome to the Jennifer Sheehan Show. I'm Jennifer. We would love to give you our digital magazine. Go to the Jennifer Sheehan Show.com to subscribe. I'd love to introduce you today to Sue Lankar. Hi, Sue. Hi. Patrick and Sally. Hello. Brother and sister. So good to have you guys on the show. Thank you. Brian Lankar, attorney, was your husband and your father. And um, Grace was your 16 year old daughter. Yes. And uh, you mentioned that when Grace was in third grade, um, she tried to commit suicide by taking pills. And uh, tell us how this all started um, from a young age. What was Grace like? Well, interesting, when she was a baby, she was just the cutest in the light of all of our lives and happy as could be. I wish I could pinpoint. I can't tell you how much I've studied her pictures, trying to figure out at what point did that change. She herself told me that after third grade is when she became unhappy. Right. She was just always kind of a homebody, um, whereas other children would like to go spend the night or have other children spend the night or go to sleepaway camp. She didn't want to or do activities like soccer or brownies or she just wanted to be home. She wanted to be with her family. But now when she was with us, it's not like she wasn't, she was hysterically funny and had almost a perverse sense of humor. And so it's not like she just sat around sad all the time at all. Mm -hmm. She was very amusing mm -hmm. and quite beyond her years. I always attributed that to her having older siblings and going so many places with me. So she was around adults a lot, right. but I, I think so much of when people are depressed, it's the voices inside their head. It's the self-critical -criti nature right. of I'm not good enough, of what they tell themselves that we don't see or hear, right. that they put on a face for the rest of the world of I'm fine. And you only, so like the first time she took pills, we were shocked, totally shocked. Right. because we had no idea we thought she was a little different you know so i didn't it didn't set off any huge right. alarms all, all kids are different right so right. you have five children and two of them right here and so how was your sister different than you guys for me personally i was very much into sports and into the outdoors so grace was um for sure more into fashion and clothes and, and things of that My nature. My kind of girl. <laughs> yes, she was for And like sure. mama, right? Yeah. Yes, um, and she was bold. I would also say that I would not describe myself as really bold in terms of like her fashion. She wasn't afraid to stand out and to be her own person. Um, so I would say that's a main difference in her and I. I would say, first of all, that Grace would love you. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can tell that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Different between me and her, I would say uh, she was very mature for her age and almost preferred to play with adults, uh, which is very interesting. I think part of that, though, is that she struggled to connect with her peers a little bit. Right. Um, but she was immensely talented in the performing arts, which I cannot say that I am. Mm -hmm. You know, and I always admired her talent. And I think it was kind of a a troubled sign when she gave up um, wanting to be in plays and musicals because I mean again she was just she had a beautiful voice it's very talented and and I do not have that <laughs> right so it sounds like she was more like mama yeah well she grew up that. going I ran a theater um, and owned one and she grew up going mm -hmm. and people used to laugh and say she had this really deep voice and they said she'd sound like she had a martini in one hand and a cigarette in the other hand and be like, so what do you think about that? <laughs> you know, she was just, and she had everyone's attention up at the theater. They thought she was just the darling of the theater and she always had a quip for everything. And um, she was stunningly beautiful. St stunningly she looked so beautiful. much like you, like many of you. She was just beautiful. And you mentioned that she didn't think she was beautiful. Not at all. She didn't think she was not even. And you would tell her she was beautiful and she was beautiful, 
but she didn't see that. So you mentioned to me that all the teachers loved her and that she was popular, and uh, but she didn't feel that about herself. Yeah, she didn't. Even um, the first musical that she was in up at the Highland Park, she went to Highland Park Middle School, they give an award out of the entire cast. It's called the Cloak Award and it's selected by the entire cast as the most outstanding cast member and then it's sewn into this cloak and everybody who's ever won its name is in it and they selected her the first musical she was in so despite irrefutable evidence right she would counter that and be like i'm not i'm not very smart right but you're on the honor roll right you know i'm not very talented right right you know, but you get cast as lead roles in everything you audition for, right. and you got in Booker T. Washington. Right, you know, so that was the is, high school that she went to? Mm-hmm. How how was she in high school? You said she was um, popular and a lot of people liked her, but she still, you said, didn't fit. She, she started, felt like she didn't fit in. She started to make, I think she felt a little self-conscious about being from Highland Park because it being a wealthier neighborhood and that's kind of an inner city school. And I noticed that she tried to fit in more, like just, I teased her about all she wore were one hoodie that was Hedwig and the Angry Inch and uh, black leggings and black tennis shoes. It was like she didn't want, where she'd gone from Kate Spade dresses and cute shoes and, you know, she was my little fashionista to no longer wanting to look that, she wanted to fit in. Right. And not stand out and look, you know, as the word kids would say now, bougie. You know, she didn't want to look like that. She wanted to look. But all of her classmates, especially after she died, came up and told me how friendly she was and how nurturing she was to kids that didn't feel liked or were having a crisis of confidence, uh, being in a show that they didn't think they could do it or they were good enough. Right. So she likes supporting the underdog. She re- always, from the time she was a little girl, she would go find the child on the playground that was sitting by themselves. And I think that's because she felt like that child. Right. And you said that she struggled with always wanting to be thinner yes. and look better. Like, and it's interesting to me because she, she just looked healthy and beautiful in all the pictures. But she had a, a, her next oldest sister um, was really tiny and I think she compared herself to her and unfortunately I think today's girls really set the standard of being so thin right. and she had this like, like Marilyn Monroe figure which was right. stunning I mean just stunning this tiny waist and unfortunately she got this up here for me so she was huge but it was this voluptuous figure, but that isn't what she wanted. She wanted to be like stick thin. Right. And so she thought she was fat. I mean, she really, I mean, wasn't pleased with her body image at all. She had real self, was very self-conscious about it. When we come back, shocking tragedy hits the family. We'll be right back. The Jennifer Sheehan TV show is real people with real stories of redemption, miracles, and overcoming. This is a TV show that gives God all the glory. The show is a 501c3 nonprofit giving back 100% of donations towards the Jennifer Sheehan TV show. We also partner with Operation Care International, serving and supporting the homeless. In a world that is spreading fake hope, only Jesus Christ and the Holy Bible have the supernatural power to change people and their circumstances. Production for the Jennifer Sheehan TV show is extensive, and we need partners to keep it on air. If you believe in our cause, please prayerfully consider to be a partner for a $20 donation a month or more. May God bless you. Welcome back to the Jennifer Sheehan Show. Okay, Sue, so your daughter, you guys caught her smoking marijuana in her room and you were on her about it, which what parent wouldn't be? 
And how did she react to your husband? Kind of defiant and angry. She kind of felt at the hypocrisy of the fact that he had been sober for 23 years and had relapsed. And his birthday had been the week before. And he had come home inebriated, and we had had to cancel his birthday party. So she had a fight with him about that and threw that up to him that he was being hypocritical. Right. And then he threatened to send her to a girls' school. And she said, no, you won't. I'll just kill myself. Wow. And he said, you're not going to just threaten suicide to get out of trouble. Right. And she said, I'm not just threatening it. And you had that conversation with her, though, because I'm sure you were worried about that, where you told her you loved her that night? Yes. As a matter of fact, he went to bed yeah. after, it was well after 3 AM. And I talked to her for a long time. And I held her, and I was crying. And I just said that they may as well bury me with her, yeah. that I couldn't go on if anything happened to her. And please, please don't even think about anything like that. Because she had done so much better than she had in the past. She had had friends and been going out and had a boyfriend. And you know, I just tried to encourage her and told her. And I'm so grateful for those last moments that I told her how much I loved her and that she meant to me and that I couldn't bear it if she wasn't here, which I had only told her a thousand times before. But that was the last thing I said to her. And I thought she was OK when I left the room. Right. I thought. What happened? Then she never even touched the bed again, we, from what we could tell. Unfortunately, my husband had left a gun that I didn't know about in the house from when he had gone hunting a few weeks ago. And she knew where it was. She always knew where everything in the house was. And she went and got the gun out of the guest bedroom. And Patrick was to later determine that she Googled how to load it and went immediately to a guest bathroom and shot herself. I mean, immediately. Wow. I don't think she took 15 minutes to do it. I'm so sorry. So she takes your husband's gun and shoots herself in the head. <clears throat> Who um, found her? He found her first. And we did not hear the gun go off that night. I sleep with the noise machine. Yeah. And it was far enough back in the house, I guess, that it's a pretty big house. And um, he, I just heard it. And I thought I heard him say, Grace tried to kill herself. So I went running back there, and he went. I don't even know where he went, but I, I think he went to call the police. Or, But I went back there. I was alone with her. And I tried to sit her up and just held on to her. She was laying sp sprawled on the ground. And I just, my mind couldn't even take it in that sight of her laying there on the floor. As a matter of fact, I've had to go to counseling just to try to get the images out of my mind. Right. Have been so horrific. But I didn't want to leave her side. Because that's your baby. It's my baby. I can't imagine, Sue, no one should have to go through what you went through. To, to have your 16-year-old daughter shoot herself in the head, and then you see that and you be there. But you're right. How could you not, no matter what that looked like, that's your daughter. So I'm so sorry that you had to go through that. I th I'm not sure which moment was worse, seeing that or seeing them bring her downstairs in the body bag. And they wouldn't let me near it. Because they literally treated us like we were criminals. 
they made us leave and they separated us and they wanted, I guess they have to do that, but right. it was just grueling. I mean, I was in my robe, you know, I wasn't even dressed and they were just wanting details and go over the, go over it again. And, you know, I've, I finally looked at Brian, I said, do they think we did something? You know, I mean, it was just, mind-blowing to me. I mean, it was a really and difficult... And you're already in shock. Yeah. Because you're seeing your daughter like that, already in shock, and then having to go through that as well. And it went on, and I don't even know what happened. I mean, it's a total blank to me, like how they found out, how I just know my other son showed up, Abby showed up. I, I, I was just in a complete... But I remember yelling at Brian, you did this. And he was just crying. And he said, I know I did. I said, this is your fault. And he was just beyond crushed. Right. When we come back, how you move forward. A house is built with walls but a home is built with memories. Firehouse Movers takes great pride and honor in serving your moving needs. Built over a fireman's code of ethics to be truthful and honest at all times, to display excellence, respect, and loyalty, we are honored for you to entrust us with your valuable memories. And we have been doing so for over 20 years with hundreds of five-star reviews. We never compromise in quality because we understand that it's easier to explain our prices than to apologize for poor service. Call us today at 972-412-6033 and let us tell you why we're passionate for what we do. Learn more at firehousemovers.com. By His grace, we live. By His will, we bond together to serve you. A record number of people are embracing a full digital work culture. Social media now is the most effective way to reach new and existing customers. We know social media, websites, SEO, voiceover IP marketing, and many more. Visit multimediabusinesssolutions.com slash report to download a free report of the top five mistakes companies are making in this digital era. At MBS, we equip you with superior marketing tools so you could have the advantage over your competition. Welcome back to the Jennifer Sheehan Show. So your husband was having a hard time, all of your family was having a hard time, but blaming himself for your daughter's suicide. And with that, you said that he just lost it with cocaine and alcohol. And what happened with your husband? Well, six days later, um, we were sitting in church and we got a call that he was at the hospital. I didn't even know what it was about. We just went over to the hospital and they told us that he had died. He had been supposed to meet me at church and he had gone by the office in the morning and he had overdosed on cocaine at the office. I'm so sorry. So I went from one Monday picking out Grace's casket to the next Monday picking out his. I can't even imagine with your whole family going through that and with you, that was your father and your sister. I just can't imagine. I'm so sorry that you guys had to go through that. So on a, on a positive note, when you were mentioning that um, your grandchildren being born, and I could, I could just see a big smile on your face because that just gives you hope right there, right? Right. And, and your hope and your faith, and your faith that you know that grace is with Jesus and you're going to be reunited the, with her. I spoke at the funeral and I said that I think that the minute Grace closed her eyes, she opened her eyes and she saw Jesus. And I 
believe someone told me one time, and it's nothing new, but I did say it at the funeral. I said, we're Easter people, and it isn't about the crucifixion, and it is, so it isn't about Grace's death. It's about the resurrection, and it's about see, I'll see her again. Right. And I have to look at her as she's still my daughter. I still consider her my child. I still consider her legacy important to me. I mm. still love her. I still talk to her. I still want to keep her memory alive. I know I'll see her again. And that gives me this much, not a lot, right. but this much comfort and peace knowing that I'll be with her again. Right. That I can't imagine if I thought I'd never see her again. Right. And knowing that she's at peace. I'm finally at peace. And you have all these beautiful strawberries to represent <laughs> and your bracelet. What's your bracelet say? It says, live with grace. I love it. It's so beautiful. You're a girl after my own heart yes. with all that bling. Yeah, that's... <laughs> I love that. And then your earrings. Or, yeah. Show or, us your earrings. So they're strawberry. Yeah, I had them made. And the strawberry I, necklace to yeah. match. Because and then you have a strawberry top on. Okay, what's the strawberry thing? So the strawberry, art, we started a foundation in honor of Grace, uh, the Grace Longcar Foundation. And we focus on suicide prevention and awareness, particularly with teens. And our logo has a strawberry on it because strawberries are what Grace loves. Her Instagram account had a lot of strawberries on it. And so anyways, that is um, what we use for our logo and kind of just a symbol of carrying on her legacy. I love that. Um, what advice would you give to other moms that have children that are suffering from depression? is number one, take it very seriously. Never think that talking about suicide is gonna put that idea in your child's mind. It won't. If they're thinking about it, you're not going to trigger it. So never, ever be afraid to ask your child, are you considering suicide? That's the most important thing you can ask your child because it's record high numbers now. And you need to have that dialogue with your child. And so that's the most important thing that you can do is to, to get your child help. Uh, a counselor, maybe they need medication. The counselor can determine that if they need to see a psychiatrist. Right, because you or, did get your child Yeah, she was, seeing a, her... she was seeing a therapist and she hid it from him. I met with him right afterwards. He, she didn't, she told him about some acting out she'd done that I didn't know about, but I, she did not tell him anything about being suicidal. And I honestly don't know that it wasn't just an impulsive, in that moment, I'll show you decision, which is what kids that age do, is they don't think about the permanence of it. Right. They think it's a temporary solution you know, it's a permanent solution to a temporary problem they have in their life. She mm -hmm. was in trouble at school for something. She just got in trouble for smoking pot in her room. So it was just like, she was mad at her dad. So to them, to a teenager, that's just overwhelming. Right. And so they just make a snap decision because their brains aren't even fully formed yet and mm -hmm. they aren't rational. And so it's really important to have that talk with your child about feelings and right. stay really and connected. And let them know that that feeling, that it is a feeling, it is emotion, it will pass. And you're right, look at the difference. I mean, we're all adults now, but when we were young, that football game or that person or that boy liking us or whatever it was, was like, so important and such a big deal. And now as an adult, we're like, ah, that's nothing. Right. You know, but it was the end of the world when we were young. You build it can be that, the yeah. end of the world as an adult. True. And one of the things that I have hung on to is this too shall pass. Right. You know, as I have been in the depths of despair, as knowing that even the pain that I'm in, that it's greater time, and one of them is holding Sally's baby. 
How old you know, is your baby, Sally? Ten months. Ten months. What joy is that, Sue, I mean, to hold your grandbaby? Yeah, and she's just the cutest thing in the whole world. And you have two grandchildren two now. Two granddaughters. I love that. And they're just absolutely adorable. And I decorated. I took Grace's old room. It took me years to do it, but I redid it into a nursery for the girls. Oh, I love that. That's a beautiful way to honor Grace. With, I just love that. What is the website for your foundation, Sally? www.gracelongcarfoundation.org. Perfect. Thank you guys so much for coming and sharing your story. I know that was so hard to do that, but I believe what you've learned in your foundation and the advice you've given, I believe that you're going to be able to help other people that are watching the show, give them some hope. Thank, okay. thank, thank you. you. Thank you. When we come back, you can also be reunited with your loved ones. We'll be right back. There are over 100,000 people in the United States waiting for a life-saving organ transplant. This is where the David Nicholas Organ Donor Awareness Foundation provides help. Please join us and be a hero and help us save a life. That first bite was to my face. <laughs> Had a pistol behind me. He set the home on fire and burned my whole world to the ground. The hammer, I bludgeoned him. The bullet went through the lung and through his heart. The assassin, I'm here to kill you. I uh, felt the bullet hit me and he became suicidal. God will give you the strength to press on if you put your trust in Jesus. I'm just here to tell you that your son will not make it. And God wasn't through with it. I blamed myself for it. My father took offense to it, punched me in the face. You sold drugs and you were a pimp Punch me in the face, knock me on the bed. When you're sexually abused, when you're physically abused, this is how big my tumor was. Wow. Told me that there were no more traces of blood clots. So I figured out a way to solve the problems okay. in our family, and uh, I figured out a way to kill Dad. Who are you to say that God can't change this? For more inspirational stories, see the Jennifer Sheehan TV show Saturdays at 11.30 a.m. on Channel 33. Welcome back to The Jennifer Sheehan Show. You also can be reunited with your family if you're saved. If you haven't prayed to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, pray with me. Jesus, I know you died on the cross for my sin. You rose on the third day. Please forgive me for my sin. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Tune in next week. We have another powerful story for you.